speakers are Julie Young, John Stark, Philippe Bertrand, Haley Papas, Elia Petridis, and moderated by Clyde D'Souza. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. I see there's a very focused group of filmmakers are interested in VR out here. Now, with me, I'm actually privileged to share the stage with all these, with all these professionals in VR filmmaking, and I thought I'd go ahead and, and do an intro on them, a one-minute intro, but now I see that I think they should be connecting with you guys directly, so let them own their one minute of fame, and uh, we start off with intros. Who wants to go first? I think, Julie? <laughs> Is this on? Okay. Um, hi, I'm Julie. Um, I'm a producer at Emblematic Group. Um, we are a studio based out of Los Angeles, California. Um, we were, our CEO is Nani de la Pena, who's, um, she's considered the godmother of VR. Um, she made the first ever VR documentary and brought it to Sundance in 2012. Um, so yeah, we're a studio, we do mostly um, immersive journalism stories. So we work with people like Al Jazeera America and um, the World Economic Forum. And um, yeah, that's... Philippe. Hi, I'm Philippe. I'm part of Be Another Lab. We are an interdisciplinary collective that uh, run this project called The Machine to Be Another. It's a system based in neuroscience and that uses uh, virtual reality to create the brain illusion that the user is in the body of another person. And it's a long-term research about empathy. How can you help people to put themselves in the shoes of the other? Hi, I'm Haley with Riot. Um, thank you all so much for coming and thank you for having me. We at Riot, we are a news and media company that uses what we call next generation storytelling uh, to compel people to act, to uh, move people to do something that they care about. Um, and, and for us, virtual reality has become that storytelling tool uh, for right now and, and for the foreseeable future that we use really across all of our pillars. So for us, that's news and films and, and creative client-facing work. So we're using VR similarly for a lot of journalism, um, experimental films, and with a lot of different nonprofits and foundations to show the impact of their work on the ground. Um, and, and for us, it's become really the most effective storytelling tool to move people to act. So it's exciting to be here with you all and to hear what you're up to and, and see what we may be able to do together. Okay, hello, hello everybody. So my name's Jonathan Stark and I'm from a company called The Foundry. So compared to this panel, which is very creative, uh, I'm on the technology end of the spectrum. So the Foundry produces software tools for the post-production industry and creative industries. We have a tool called Nuke, which is a compositor for film VFX. So from, from our perspective, we see a lot of content creators producing really exciting pieces. And our interest is understanding what tools are needed in the future to make it easier to produce really high quality content. So I'm really excited to be here. Uh, hi, I'm Ilya Petridis. Um, I run Filmatics, my company, and I'm a traditional storyteller out of features and music videos that's now using VR to sort of turn plots and build character and take advantage of the space to really um, bring that element of delight to counter the empathy that's happening in VR to sort of have a conversation between delight and empathy. So I'm really, really happy to be here. Thanks. Thank you, guys. So we've got a whole, the whole gamut in VR. We've got um, filmmakers, we've got uh, the post-production, production, I think, distribution as well, and uh, immersive journalism. Um, by show of hands, can I see how many filmmakers are out here? Okay. People interested in distribution? Okay. Uh, the press? Okay, so great. So um, let's get started with... Um, virtual reality filmmaking. I think we'll concentrate on cinematic VR filmmaking more than on the other aspects of VR, which is popular right now, for example, gaming and uh, things like that. Unless uh, there are people who are interested in gaming, we'll, we will get into that a bit. But when we talk about filmmaking, in fact, um, well, what happened was that I came across quotes, for, for example, from James Cameron. You know, he's like the god of, let's say, technology when it comes to filmmaking, but, but he seems to be kind of um, not really 
taken up with we are. In fact, I got one of his quotes out here just so that I don't misquote him. And he says, what will the level of interactivity with the user be other than just I can stand and look around? If you want to move through virtual reality, it's a video game. It's been around forever. So it looks like he's a bit skeptical. And recently, Ed Catmull, who's co-founder of Pixar, uh, is probably riding the same boat. And he said, uh, linear narrative is an artfully directed telling of a story where the lighting and the sound is all for a very clear purpose. We are not just wandering around in a world, what we do in VR. Now with the Oculus, they're saying it's a new storytelling medium. It's good, but it's not storytelling. The fact that you've changed the technology and people are excited about it doesn't change the underlying difficulty of the compelling narrative story. What do you guys think? And remember, you could be quoted by the press. <laughs> Start out with an easy one. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? Is, there, is, is what we're doing in virtual reality only for gaming, or is there you know, scope for storytelling, for visual storytelling? Yeah, I'm happy to speak to that. So I think what we're hearing is, is sort of a reflection of where we are with VR right now. Um, you know, the, the technology is there, and the proof of concept is there, and what's not there yet is the content, right? We're, we're just now getting to a moment in time where we're starting to create content in VR, distribute it so that people can see it, and it's frankly just now starting to become part of our, part of our vocabulary and language. So, you know, I think to, to say that virtual reality, you know, is something that's just for the aesthetic, or you're just gonna look around, or what's the story, what we're experiencing is quite the opposite. You know, we're finally at a point in time where we're getting to really experiment with storytelling inside VR. You know, what, how, how do you direct a piece? How do you direct your audience inside VR? Is it with audio cues? Is it with visual cues? What about split screen in VR? You know, it's all these sort of really rudimentary um, storytelling tools that we know so well in, in video and literature and, and every other means we're just now getting to start to play with in VR. So I think it's, it's an exciting moment in time, and, and frankly, it's a challenge that we all get to approach together. I, sorry. I couldn't agree with you more, honestly. I think the quotes hit upon the fact that there's no grammar quite yet. We were talking just a second ago into how to do that. So as a, storytelling, as a storyteller, when I was faced with this task of you know, building characters, there were, you have to navigate the traditional with the new. There's all sorts of things that work traditionally. For example, all of a sudden, theater actors become really valuable, right? People that can work in one fluid take with four GoPros going at the same time and not break for a close-up or an insert, that's really special. So the stage actor becomes really valuable. Your ears become really valuable. Whereas, yeah, sure, this was always the case, you know, here and there, but all of a sudden, all the old stuff, like, how do you say, like, choose your own adventure, which was something that was, like, passé 30 years ago, all of a sudden becomes really valuable because now you can have focus gazes where you fall into other, you know, angles of the camera and fall into other rooms, right? So I think they're a little early on the quote there. I think they haven't seen it yet. That's, that's encouraging. John, you had something? I think the, the only thing I'd add to that is to, to look at the productions that have been done already and for me, I always ask, uh, what is it added when I'm watching back in 360? So there's been a few really high profile, really interesting, I would call them experiments. So there was a, a short movie called The Mission that was produced, I don't know how many people might have seen it. And the idea behind that is you, you follow a World War II troop as they go on a mission. And you're following the troop and then you're inside a tank. And you know, it's an amazing technical achievement and it's really impressive, and sometimes it really adds something, but the rest of the time you feel that you might have just as well have experienced that out of the cinema. And then there's the Google ATAP help experience. It's really interesting to see what it's done and where it can go next, I think. Do you want to say something? Yeah, and I mean, to speak to that, we had, um, we had a piece called Project Syria that we brought to Sundance last year, and it, it basically puts you on scene in the middle of war-torn Syria, so it's a very intense piece. Um, it, it's also full positional tracking, so you are walking around the space to, um, I think, James Cameron's quote. Um, um, but, you know, we had people take off the headset in tears, like in full-on tears, you know, saying, I've seen this on TV, I've seen it in 2D, I read articles about it all the time, but now I get it. 
And I think it's that, you know, even though you're sort of passively experiencing something, it's that, that, that part of it. I get it. That's, that's the next generation of storytelling. Yeah. If I may add. Sure, sure. Um, it's very interesting, the, the possibilities that VR open to us in a way of to get very deep in the subjectivity, deep inside people's hearts, like say like this, I just I say like people cry after some experiences. Uh, Mel Slater, which is a, a researcher, like the, probably the, the, the grandfather of embodiment and, and, and VR, he r ran this experiment, for example, that um, a, white, a white woman would see herself in the body of a digital avatar with dark skin. And they were measuring uh, implicit racial bias, which is not the bias that you state, but the subjective bias, no? And just the fact of being inside uh, someone's body with a dark skin, it drastically reduces implicit racial bias, which is something very difficult to reduce, even if you do long, long, long years of therapy. So the possibility of a brain plasticity, of opening people's minds uh, towards uh, others' perspectives are, are huge. So, yeah, so I was checking up on Philippe's work uh, yesterday on, on the internet, and for people who have not really experienced VR, and of course many probably haven't, uh, given that it's just, it's all new, but there, there is a Samsung um, couple of, uh, I think, devices out there, and I, I urge you to try it out if you've not already tried it out. Now, from the filmmaking per, uh, point of view, it's like it's not just people out here on, on, on this panel gushing because they're into filmmaking and because they're into the technology. Uh, Hollywood itself is really head on into it for those of you who might not know, I just repeat myself. Um, people like Lucasfilm, um, 20th century, 21st century Fox, everyone's actually using VR, at least in this stage, to uh, let's say tie in with, with one of the tentpole productions, like The Martian has got a VR experience. Um, what was the other ones? I think um, the Reese Witherspoon movie had a VR experience. So basically, uh, what I'm saying is that filmmakers are looking at uh, expanding the whole, uh, you know, the whole kind of the art, taking it further, the, the visual storytelling, breaking the fourth wall, as, as it were, um, into, uh, so Netflix, for example, um, they've launched a VR app on, 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 on the Gear VR. So while you're still watching 2D videos, uh, you're watching Netflix in 2D, I believe at some point they probably will commission original content uh, for stereoscopic 360 VR filmmaking. Um, let's go to, to uh, Ilya, I think. Um, tell us something about the current project. I think you sent me a brief uh, note on, on what you're working on. And given that you've got experience, I believe, in this side of the world, as well as in, uh, in, in Europe, um, what what you what are you working on, and is there anything relevant that you would like to work on um, locally or regionally? What would you see would work in VR as a topic? Uh, well, I, I was tasked by a, a studio in uh, in Venice Beach in Los Angeles uh, called Weaver, who came to me with some pretty specific technical initiatives that they wanted to push the technology forward. Um, but. First and foremost, I approached it as a fan in terms of what do I want to what do I want to see? If I was in my bedroom and I was, you know, bored and I had a pair of VR goggles, where would I want what would, where would what would I want to do? Right? Um, so, I I made a séance in virtual reality where you sort of sat around a table to call a ghost, but obviously the wrong ghost shows up, right? Which is incredibly scary. But 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 also because I. I sort of come out of this, it, it, it was very important to me that the story secede the novelty of the technology. This is, this is I think, a big, a big problem here because a lot of people are going to surf on the novelty of VR for a while. So the minute you can leapfrog over that and become, whereas it's just another tool in your tool shed. Now you've got sextets to use. You've got object-based panning. You've got all these different ways to tell stories. Now you've as an artist, you've got this whole new canvas. Rather than it being, oh, but it's in VR, right? Because I've seen some stuff like that. And it's tough because you've only got one shot at a first impression with a new medium like that. That's really tough, right? So I was given that initiative to do something. And I thought, well, what do I want to do? I want to get rid of the rails. I don't want people to feel like they're stuck in their goggles. So what would make sense? It was, well, sitting at a table would make sense. So little, little things like that. And, and as an artist and as a filmmaker, I sort of thought to myself, well, 
What's the horror of VR? If it turned out to be a horror piece, what's that? what is that? All my heroes went along those lines. Well, what's the horror of VR? It's the ability to see the world through someone else's eyes. So the ghost that shows up is missing his eyes, and he's looking for the perfect pair that might fit. And yours look pretty good, right? So it's almost this sort of thing where we can sort of discuss the medium as a byline and have this headline of this you know, this event, this very high concept seance in VR, where the ghost can bounce around you and people can whisper in your ear and you're not quite sure where he is and you're following him. So all of a sudden, the whole space becomes really useful, right? It's something you can't do on 2D film, right? So, so what happens um, you, you, if you come up with, for example, from, let's say, the producer's point of view, uh, Julie, if someone comes in, uh, do you all, uh, you're the emblematic group, right? If someone comes in with a kind of like a proposal to, to make a film, do y'all actually uh, fund people? Do, are y'all interested in that kind of uh, work at the Emblematic Group? Or is it all self-made? Uh, yeah, I mean, at, at this point, we, um, we, we want to do that eventually. Um, I'd say that's like step five, and right now we're at step one. Um, right now we're just at the place where we're, um, we're working with you know, groups like the World Economic Forum, Al Jazeera, um, and Planned Parenthood, making pieces that they, we, we allow that, uh, whoever we're working with to like executive produce the project. So they in some ways become, have um, you know, a large amount of like director power in a way. Um, but yeah, eventually we would like to go that route. Yeah, because I guess uh, right now, how would someone go about actually uh, getting someone to, f like a producer, to actually fund uh, or go for a VR film? Let's say, I believe that you can't really make a one-hour VR film because it's not been proven that people will probably wear it that long. What's your opinion? Is that feasible right now, or should there be sh it's just short films in, in VR? What would you say, uh, Haley? Yeah, I mean, I don't think we at least historically, as in back to April, <laughs> I don't think we really go much longer than like eight minutes with most of our VR pieces. And uh, it's for a couple of reasons. I think one, the hardware has yet to catch up with the technology. So, you know, we're all shooting on a variety of different cameras, but probably the, the most well-known are the GoPro rigs, right? So these are anywhere from two, four, six, you know, 16 different GoPros all rigged together to capture a 360 image, um, 360 video, and we're shooting in 4K. So the image quality is beautiful. It's such high resolution. And, and when we're editing it, it looks wonderful. Um, but then, you know, the, ta the hardware itself, you're streaming these on a phone. At the end of the day, like in this headset, that's just a Samsung phone clicked into there, right? And and so it's it's wonderful, it's fully immersive, but but the the quality of the image gets diluted because of the little plastic goggles that you're looking through and whatnot. Um, so so I think for a number of reasons, like your eye doesn't want to stay in there, right? We don't want to stay. I don't want to stay in that headset for longer than eight to twelve minutes. Um, okay, I would that's say. great. Well, yeah, I've got, one, I've got one of these Samsung phones, so I believe that uh, these are going to be the new kind of, uh, let's say, IMAX is strapped to your face uh, once you have the Gear VR with you. Uh, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of tech talk out there. I think maybe, John, could you tell us what, what are like the, uh, let's say, the camera systems? I'm sure the filmmakers out here would want to know what would be the state of the art right now to capture good um, uh, well, 360. So so I think it's, um, it's really quite an interesting time for the camera systems right now. So, so from our perspective over the last year, uh, a lot of people have been shooting with GoPros. It's very accessible. You can buy a bunch off the shelf and you can tape them together and away you go and you can shoot 360. And GoPros are great cameras. You know, you can get really good co color out of them. But to get a real cinematic experience, you need the dynamic range in your camera rig. So there, are, there have been uh, uh, rigs out there that you can use. So the, for example, there's the head case action cam rig uh, that has uh, much better cameras. It's got 11 stops on it. So you can actually get that, that real depth to create a really nice experience. But it's been very hard for people to get hold of these rigs and shoot with them and deal with them in post. So they're all and DIY right now. So pretty much people have been building their own. I mean, you can, you can actually get some quite decent monoscopic 360 content using off-the-shelf rigs like Freedom 360 or something like that. But right now, there's, there's, there's quite a lot going on. So Nokia Ozo recently announced their, their rig. So I think you, can, you might even be able to pre-order it. So Nokia How Ozo... Much? 
How much would you any so any idea? So the Nokia Oso is um, sixty thousand US dollars. So that's quite okay. expensive, but it's 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 targeted at the premium end of the spectrum. So it's a point and shoot. You, you it's it's point up. and shoot. I mean, it answers a lot of questions actually. So. As I understand it, I'm not involved in production, but one of the issues when you're on set and you want to shoot is you need to be able to get a live preview of the 360 content that you're capturing so that you know you've got the right thing or if you need to, to reshoot it or restage it. That's really important. So one of the things the Ozo gives you is that live preview um, and you've got all the data that you can download and then have available afterwards. So it's, it, it solves a lot of problems. Um, I don't know how tech... I could go on for hours on this stuff. Okay. But, so is, we got, no, no, let, let's, more. let's ask someone from the audience. Is, is there anyone who's interested in, uh, in, in shooting or has shot a 360? Well, hi. Uh, I'm Obed. I'm from Namibia. I haven't shot um, using VR yet, but I, I'm just interested to find out, you know, how do you stitch it all together? You know, 16 cameras, how do you stitch it all together? So at the moment, a lot of people are using off-the-shelf uh, nodal stitching software like PTGUI, Color, APG, and these, I mean, they're really great bits of software. They don't work for stereo capture. Are you shooting for monoscopic 360? Monoscopic. So I would recommend, well, I'm not going to re recommend anyone because there's journalists in the audience. Go, go, go ahead. You're so allowed I, you to should say only use our software. But um, You're allowed to say Nuke is the de facto standard for good quality <laughs> stitching. So try, try the tools that are out there, Color, for example, and APG. So they're, they're, they're great tools. Keep, keep your eyes out because there's a bit of a significant difference between a rough stitch and a deep stitch. So you, you keep your nose to the grindstone about that sort of thing because it, it, you'll tell the difference when you're watching it. So just, just to pick that up, what, what we see, so we, we produce a tool called Nuke. It's a post-production tool. And we see people doing rough stitches with tools like Color and APG, just to get a preview, do a rough edit, then that edit comes for final stitch, would be, which will be done in a post-production tool. And at that point, what you're doing is you're breaking apart the input video, you're actually rebuilding that 360 environment in order to get a perfect stitched output. And actually, that's, it's a really important thing to be able to get really high quality results. I mean, there are, there's some amazing 360 pieces out there, but there's also some 360 work out there that is not so great for stitching. And then it's, uh, it's a bad experience because you see the seams and, and tear lines between the different cameras that, that captured that 360 experience. Can, can I just speak about the sure. Ozu real quick for the filmmakers in the room that's cool about it? Mm. The preview is excellent, really, really great. But the one through the grapevine that I'm hearing about the Ozu that's really neat is that it lets you map your audio very easily in post. Meaning that, which gives you immersion, right? So meaning that if I've got my headphones on and you're talking in my right ear and I turn, you drift further from me. Do you see what I'm saying? And the Ozu is coming, that technology, rather than doing it in post, is coming stitched into the camera which is super, super cool, because it makes dialogue awesome, stuff coming through the windows awesome. Like, your quadrants become much more mappable through sound. So as a filmmaker, that's an enormous help. Yeah, and I would say the nuances and technological advancements like those are what, are what propel the storytelling itself, right? So if, if I hear him talking over there, that's going to direct my attention to look over there. So suddenly I, I have a say as a director in what my, what my viewer is experiencing. So, yeah, we've got... Sorry, John, you wanted to say something? Yeah. So, so the other thing to add about Ozo from the technical point of view is that it, it captures pretty much stereo 360 everywhere. So at the moment when you see 360 video, it's, it's usually monoscopic. There is some stereoscopic 360 out there where you get some depth perception. But that depth, when it's baked down to a 360 view, is only on one horizon. So something to watch out for with this rig, I think, in the future is the fact that it can, it can capture 360 everywhere. So it'll be really interesting next year to see if we start to see delivery of 360 wherever you look in the world. So, that's, that's so yeah, I think uh, the whole point of let's 
I mean, literally, if you say virtual reality, is to put you in a kind of uh, virtual reality place, or a virtually real world. And if you're going to do that, I mean, this whole debate of monoscopic versus stereoscopic. Uh, monoscopic, I've seen, I've seen the difference. It looks like it's just wallpaper tied to a globe. So the, the gold standard should be stereoscopic, which means a camera for your left eye, camera for your right eye. And I believe that's kind of tough right now to do it in full 360. Um, what is your take? Is, 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 it, is cinematic VR in monoscopic still VR? Does it qualify on, as being called VR? Or does it have to be stereoscopic 3D? I, all I can say is I'd love to know the answer to that question. I think I, 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 would, I would ask the question, what does it add to the experience? Because if you just need to understand the space or be in someone's situation, then maybe it's okay for it to be monoscopic because you just need to understand the situation. Um, maybe, well, I don't know. I've no, I, I would entirely agree. So as I mentioned, we, we do a lot of VR for, for news as well as for films. So for the news pieces where there's a sense of urgency, uh, we tend to produce those in monoscopic only because we're trying to get these out as quickly as possible. And it's a lot more stitching, it's a lot more cameras, it's much more intrusive to bring in a stereoscopic rig and it delays the, the delivery. Um, you know, so we recently released a piece with the Associated Press out of the Calais jungle. Um, which is you know, the largest migrant camp in Western Europe. And so it, it was one man shooting by himself and in these relatively trying circumstances. And you know, as much as we would love for that experience to be stereoscopic, what was more important to us was to get that, to get that content and to get it out quickly to our audiences while it was still timely and important. Now for the, for the pieces that are more experimental films and you know, when it's a client facing project you know, where we have time, we recently actually, as you were mentioning for films, we recently did a virtual reality experience for Room, the film, I don't know if any of you all saw it here. Um, so we did it inside the Room set and it's fully stereoscopic and you know, the notion is the anatomy of a scene and so the, the set and production designer really walks you through uh, how they mapped the lighting and how they how they dressed that set so to have that stereoscopic was really important for us and we had we had the breathing room to be able to do that so yeah. well, I was just gonna say we um we did do um, I, I had met a filmmaker who was doing a 360 video and he would tell he would he would show people things in mono and say it was in stereo and people couldn't tell so people would be like, oh, wow, I can tell. It looks beautiful. And it, but it was actually just in mono. <laughs> so, I think, so I think there's definitely some, some truth you know, to what you guys are saying. It's kind of like if you have a very trained eye and you can see that kind of stuff, you'll notice it. But you know, it's still very immersive regardless. Yeah. yeah, and actually people don't know VR yet. So they don't know what is mono or stereo. If someone that is experiencing trying stereo, you can say like at first that this is mono. But uh, on the other hand, like, for example, our work is based on low-budget technology. We don't use 360 cameras. We use only one camera attached to the body and uh, controlled by servo engines. So wherever the, we do live uh, experiences, so whatever the user looks, if looks to the left, the camera just turns to the left. So there is an impression of 360. And uh, we did it in mono, we did it in stereo, and we actually started using, uh, hacking a Sony PlayStation camera that cost five euros, and uh, this is how we started. And uh, we have been measuring uh, embodiment. Embodiment is like the, the proper term to say uh, that you feel in the body of this character. Like there's some scientists prove that you can feel yourself in the body of a, a plastic mannequin or a Barbie doll or a digital avatar. And we have been testing that, and even with low resolution, um, sometimes not good quality of light, uh, with mono camera, with a Sony Pistray, you have very, very deep experiences. So it's all about all the, all the content, all the experience that you live. And uh, maybe you watch, like, if you talk about normal movies, maybe you watch a movie made in, uh, I don't know, mini DV camera, and it's amazing. And so even it's, though the quality it's is not interesting good. what Philippe is saying because I was reading some of the work he's done and one of the projects they've done is um, the, the embodiment thing, right? Where, um, well, from what I understood is uh, you have probably a male and a female in a room and uh, 
they've got a VR headset on. Correct me if I'm wrong, because that's what I got from it. And they have a camera capturing the body. And it's kind of like a body swap, so you you know you you can see from the perspective of another person. Now this has got some far-reaching implications. Uh, I think in areas of neuroscience, uh, in psychology, psych psychology studies, and all that. What was interesting to me was at that time I was thinking: Have any film directors, any movie directors, actually got in touch with you? Um, say because you're making VR films, and usually the first person POV is, you know, could be interesting. What I'm trying to say is, say for example, a remake of um, Silence of the Lambs, where you are Hannibal Lecter. You know, would you actually have any way to work with film directors uh, based on the kind of research that you're doing um, with Be Another Machine? Uh, so far, we haven't been uh, collaborating with uh, filmmakers. Um, a couple of them spoke with us, like uh, when we've been like in film festivals, like Tribeca in uh, or ITFA or CPH. But um, we got so far for the last three years uh, interest from researchers in psychology, in neuroscience, in medicine, in technology. Uh, we have been collaborating in some projects with the United Nations, addressing issues like uh, like empathy and cultural diversity. And uh, I think it's too new. I think it's too new, it's too difficult. There is no distribution yet. Like uh, you, have, you have now the Samsung VR, you have the cardboard, you can use your mobile, but no one knows how to use it, no one try it. Oculus Rift, which is like a, a better version of headset, doesn't exist yet as a commercial version. It's gonna launch next year. So I think it's still, it's still to happen. So far, uh, we have been working live experiences and now we are, we are working on a plan of a, of a film, VR doc, that is called uh, Touching the Walls of Bethlehem. So the, the idea is that you can see yourself in the body of citizens from Bethlehem talking about the situation of being enclosed uh, by the West Bank barrier. And uh, at some point you can actually touch, touch the wall and, and feel the, that the wall exists now. And, uh, and in embodiment there is this, this combination. There's several combinations that you can do, but if you have first person perspective with a body, uh, agency, which is the ability to move as, as the, the character moves, and, and tactile feedback, uh, you cre can create this brain illusion that I see myself in the body of a woman, I know I'm not a woman, but my brain is telling me, yes, this is your body. So it's very disorientating, uh, but very deep experiences to, to get close to, to the situation. But I think it's just too new. Okay. Uh, Julie, um Let's say, for example, um, a filmmaker like Ilya completes his film. How would he show it out? I mean, is what, what are the distribution platforms? Would you know that you know that someone could actually exhibit, or is there anyone right right now? Yeah, I mean, I think for the short term future, the distribution for the most part is going to be synonymous with the hardware itself. So, if you know, Oculus has Oculus Share, which is like the equivalent of in iTunes for Oculus, like you can just download content off of there. Um, I, you know, distribution in the traditional sense, the way we talk about it for movies, has a lot to do with money and how things are gonna make money. And I think that we're so far off from knowing the answers to those questions at this point um, that it, I mean, it's just too hard to say. Okay. Uh, hey, hey, I would just say, between the conversation between delight and empathy, which is really interesting to keep my eyes on, is when you say something like, um, how can I become Hannibal Lecter? Right? That's really interesting to me because you didn't pitch it as, how can I become a serial killer that likes to eat other people? I wanted to say that, but, uh, right. you know. No but, no, but in the sense that, like, and I think the studios are throwing darts at the board here, but they haven't quite hit the bullseye yet, which is there is this element of transmedia storytelling. There's this element of, I don't want to go stand on a spaceship in VR. I want to go stand on the Millennium Falcon, right? Because that has a meaning for me. So I want to leave my bedroom and go stand on the Enterprise, right? I don't just want to stand on a spaceship, although that's delightful in its sense, but there's a, there's a second tier of that where you have an emotional connection with things that were traditionally on your wall that are now right in front of you, right? This is really something special for delightful VR. So I think it was really interesting that you said that because that's sort of the conversation that's, because, because in empathy, it's not necessarily the case. Empathy, it's about being 
parachuted into a situation where you would otherwise be so far removed from it. So for me as a storyteller, that's what I find really curious as to how that is um, neurologically and emotionally working for you, right? Yeah. If, uh, taking that further, for example, there's been there's a big debate between the two camps. You know, gamers who are into VR uh, don't really think anything filmed with video is actually virtual reality because uh, I mean their argument is that you probably can't interact with it. Uh, positional tracking, which means tracking your head so that uh, things yeah, shift and pan and move, can give you a certain feeling of uh, being there, but it does not convince a lot of people in in the gaming world. Uh, but on the VR world, I mean, uh, I would think if an event like, I think you guys covered the, the Nepal earthquake, right? Now, 20 years, and it's, and it's a good thing that you all did it, uh, even if it is in monoscopic, it is still, you know, it's a part of real life, it, it's a life event. Because my argument is like, if you go 20 years down history, and you want to actually see uh, what happened there, or for that matter, your child's first birthday, how would you do it if it's only going to be CGI or, or gaming, I mean, that's the argument. So I believe that you, I mean, on stage are probably convinced that, um, you know, virtual reality is between the two. Um, is there any other things that we're missing, like, you know, that would actually put the case forward that filmmaking is indeed virtual reality? Um, I'll try and take that one. So, um, so this, is, this is a purist question, isn't it? Virtual reality means it's virtual. So I'm not, not a purist. I think it's all about, for me, virtualized reality. So capturing 360 video, photo real content creates a believable experience, something that you can attach to. So virtualized reality for me. Yeah, so I mean, if the question, if I'm hearing it correctly, is is virtual reality filmmaking, is that right? That's the question? So. I, I think virtual reality is something more than filmmaking. I think to say it's filmmaking is limiting in a sense. Um, you know, there's a, uh, there's a lot of discussion around like, so what is VR as a tool or as a means? And you know, is it, is it the next phase of video, right? And I don't even think it's that. I mean, I think it's something m much more and encompassing than that. I think that um, in a lot of ways, VR reflects literature more than it does video, hear me out here, <laughs> because you know with, when you're reading a book, you, you are placed in that entire world, right? Like there's no, there are no parameters. Spatially, you can imagine the, the ceiling and the floor and to your left and to your right, and I think that's a bit of what VR does with us. So of course, there's the linear degree of storytelling, but there's also, there's also the physical, uh, positioning of it that to me it's it's not just filmmaking it's a new means of storytelling that doesn't fall within any you know like you were saying within any verbiage that we have yet you know it's it was interesting we did a piece in Syria as well one of our conflict journalists went to um, went inside Aleppo Syria and and captured the first sort of docu style VR piece from from Syria and um, and I mean it just we were as we were releasing it we we were confronted with okay so with the narration is is this proper journalism or does this become more experimental or is it a documentary or is it a narrative piece and it wasn't any one of those right it was somewhere at the intersection at all of all of those because it's so new like we're crafting this language we're crafting this space and and it's exciting to be there but of course we all don't know what to do when we don't have the right words for it you know when we can't place it neatly within a box but I don't know if it's filmmaking. I think it's something cool that's next. But yeah, but, but it is real. I mean, I, I think uh, you can't turn any of, of the websites or pages on, uh, on filmmaking now without seeing a new uh, startup getting funded in multi-million dollars. Uh, you know, so it's probably not just VR hype. It, is, it looks like it's a bit real. And it's probably some of the audience out here who, you know, who want to get into it probably need to understand that it is uh, real, I think. It's not just... Uh, passion for, for someone, and it is uh, going forward in, in filmmaking. John, what are some of the, uh, let's say, the technical hurdles besides the camera thing, uh, let's say, finishing in post and stuff like that, and are you guys doing something really fast to make that easy? Um, can, I, can I go back to cameras just quickly before I get to that? So, so one thing that we didn't get to touch on was the new GoPro rig that's coming out. So there's a GoPro Odyssey, 
um, and that's a collaboration between GoPro and Google. So I think what's, what's really interesting here, perhaps for this community, is that there will be camera rigs coming out that will give you the ability to press the record button, get all the footage up onto the cloud, and get that automatically stitched for you and downloaded as uh, a really nice stereo stitch. So I think this is something that's going to make it much easier to go out on location and shoot some content and have a, a really great result available without all the pain of stitching that we have today. So, but you asked about the, the post-production tools and, and things like that, things that are in the pipeline. So as, as a company, the Foundry sees a lot of people dealing with stitching, being able to try to deal with the pain of stitching right now. And that's something that we see holding back creative content creators because they want to shoot something really interesting and new and novel but actually they can't shoot what they want to because they have to stage it they have to get the performance to happen within a particular camera point of view or it has to be more than 10 meters away in order to reduce post-production time from hundreds of hours to a reasonable amount of time sorry hundreds of hours hundreds of days down to a reasonable amount of time so we're, we're trying to help that pipeline, make it easier to do stitching, and also make it easier for artists to work with 360 content. So if you, if you think of this footage that you're looking at, it's, it's all around you on a sphere. But when you work in tools in post-production, you're used to looking at standard flat images. So artists have to get their head around looking at a flattened sphere, and it's a really quite hard and complicated thing to deal with. It's, very fun. it's okay if everything's pretty much in the middle of your 360 world, but as soon as you do something interesting over the top of your head or underneath your feet, it gets very hard to deal with. So we're working on new tools to help artists work with this type of content. There, there's a wonderful balance there in terms of being able to, as the writer, as the storyteller, being able to dictate where, okay, this should be sort of proscenium arch, so forget all the other quadrants for a second, and then signifying to your user and your character in the piece when you can now start to engage your space around you and then through audio and other tools migrating them back to the proscenium arch having a moment and then do you know what I mean there's a, there's a, there's a nice tightrope going on there which is kind of cool it's interesting and i don't know if you would agree with this but we have this sort of conversation going around our team that is directing in in virtual reality in a sense more like choreography than the traditional sense of directing it's more like audio choreography which surprised me. It's all about your ear, which is uh, sh shocking. It's not so much about your eyes so much. It's all about your ear because your ear choreographs your eye exactly where it, and that's, that's how it's been since the dawn of time, right? <laughs> can, can I ask? Oh, sorry. Well, I just, I also want to point out that like, you know, you can make entire stories in CG as well. It doesn't have to be on GoPro cameras. It doesn't have to be film per se, which I think speaks to your point about it being very similar to literature. There's a whole plethora of tools that you can use to make 3D content. And I think, you know, especially the, the, the three major headsets that are coming out next year are like, you know, the PlayStation Morpheus, uh, PlayStation Morpheus, <laughs> PlayStation VR, uh, which is Sony's headset, Oculus, and the uh, HTC Vive headset. And all three of those have positional tracking, which means that you, could, you set up two cameras in your house and you can actually walk around the space. You can't walk around the space unless there's some element of uh, an actual CG 3D environment, because or else you're fixed to where the camera is. I mean, I think that, um, and there's going to be a huge space for that in terms of storytelling over the next couple of years. It's probably going to combine a lot of yeah, elements. I, of, I think, I, speaking yeah. of the whole CG world, I think Oculus themselves have a story division now, or a filmmaking division called Oculus Story. Story Studio. Story Studio, yeah. And uh, I think they did a, a shot called Hen Henry, was it Henry? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where the character actually it tries to get the people in, in, in you, know, the, you, the audience, as part of the film where he looks at you and stuff like that. And, you know, and I look at how, how could we do that for, for filmmaking? For example, you watch um, House of Cards, and every time they break the fourth wall, I mean, you know, Kevin Spacey looks directly at you and, and speaks. Would that be some kind of a gimmick, you think, in VR, or is there a creative way that you could actually get the audience to feel that they're part of the scene out mm -hmm. there? Have yes. you all experimented with that? Yes, so we have a piece called um, Use of Force, and it was about a man named Anastasio Hernandez Rojas, who was... Um, he was a Mexican migrant who had been in the U.S. for, I think, 15 years. And um, he was crossing the border back into Mexico. And he was, um, 
beaten and killed by U.S. Border Patrol. And um, so the, the witness that was there, she had taken like some limited cell phone video and um, you know they, they, they came by and asked for everybody's cell phones and she kept hers. Um, and so we recreated that piece in VR in CG. And um, what we did was we gave, so it was full positional tracking. So you, you're watching the beating as it's happening and you're using all real audio from the cell phone. So it's like you were saying, audio is like the most important thing in VR. So it's all real audio, it feels very immersive. And we gave people an, a, an, a hand input that acted as a cell phone. So when you press, it was an actual tangible object, but when you pressed it, um, it, it was a virtual cell phone that recorded whatever you were looking at. So it was almost as if you were taking evidence. Um, but, you, but you only had 30 seconds before your cell phone battery died and you couldn't record any more video. Um, so it added this kind of element, almost, almost a gamification, like interactivity element to the storytelling, um, which I think is really interesting. Yeah, in Femayet, when you say that you have like a, an object and uh, our work, we always have like the tactile input, it's, it's interesting because it's not even virtual reality. It could be, I don't know, real virtuality. No, it's not virtual, it's real, it's tactile. You touch, it exists. And uh, it's, it's another possibility to, to explore and there's lots of things to explore in it. We also made a, um, we made a virtual reality race car where it, we use like an actual um, like hydraulic force feedback car and then put a steering wheel on it and then matched up. You basically start in like the pit of an F1 race and then your car pulls up and as it pulls up, the steering wheel, the virtual steering wheel and the physical steering wheel are matched one to one. So you, right, yeah. <laughs> it's very weird. It's okay. so, so yeah, so I think you mentioned eye contact, right? And, and breaking, the, breaking that fourth wall. Fourth. Um, you know, obviously most of what we're doing is in documentary style storytelling, but we, actually that's one of the biggest and most recurring comments we get after people experience our VR pieces is, oh my God, I made eye contact with that little girl, you know, or wherever it was, whether it's in the Nepal earthquake or we did a piece for Bono's um, one.org campaign where we follow a day in the life of a little girl who lives on the border of Kenya and Tanzania. And we look at the way in which uh, extreme poverty directly and improportionately affects her as, as a young girl. And, you know, people take the headset off and are so wildly moved and time and time again, it's because they say, she looked me dead in the eye, you know? So, so as, as you're hearing this narration of her experience, this, this person is right there and they're looking at you and you're able to connect in a way that there's no separation of, of us and them or me and her, right? You know, it's, there's, there's a removal of that and I, you know, you started to touch on it with the psychology of it all and we're obviously nowhere near there yet, but it's interesting the, the studies that are, that are coming out around the fact that with VR, you know, you cognitively understand I'm not there. You know, I know that I'm in this chair, I know that I'm here now, but, our, but we experience it as if it's somehow really happening to us and we store that memory as if it really happened to us. So it's fascinating to think about the way in which, the way in which we store the memory and then how that, how that affects our actions and understandings of the world moving forward. I think, uh, the, sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, I think the direct gaze that you're saying is a gimmick. For me, it's something that's all over the piece we did. Uh, standard issue. But it's, honestly, it's all a gimmick unless it moves you, right? Uh, that, 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 that discipline doesn't change. It's, uh, he can look at you. It's all about what he says to you that's going to change the game. The fact that he can look right at you, okay, we'll only go so far. But it's all going to be about how he moves you, how he motivates you. I just, just quickly, so that it seems to bring us back to your, your first question about what VR does for storytelling. Yeah. So that it's, when it, it's useful when it adds something new to the experience. So what I hear now is that we can introduce the viewer to who they are in this, this story. That's something that you don't get from normal cinema. Who are you in this space? Why are you there in this space? But you can also make them instant friends. You can also make them feel like they've been with this group of people for a very long time like they share inside jokes. Do you know what I mean? And really have them leave their bedroom behind. Do you know, look, a look is a look, goes along, you know, it has a lot of mental real estate to be looked at like that, to be looked at amorously or to be looked at jokingly. Or, I mean, this is all, that's what changes the game. 
So what, what would this actually do to, let's say, traditional cinema? I mean, you know, uh, it's in a way you could call it a completely alienating experience watching a film, although it is like an IMAX when you put that with the headset on, it's like a huge screen, but you're watching it alone. And going to the movies is going to the movies, you know, it's a whole social experience. Oculus is working, I believe, on something like, like that. What, what is your take on actually VR filmmaking and consumption of it in a social context? Um, sure. Can I? Yeah, sure. um, I mean, I think people today are, are more comfortable than ever before with virtual representations of themselves. Um, you know, Nani, our CEO, tells a story all the time where, um, you know, her, 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 her son was in, you know, in the living room and her daughter walked in and um, her son looks up and says, why did you leave? And what he meant was, why did you leave Minecraft? <laughs> you know, and I think that that, that that is just so representative of today's world where we're very comfortable and we actually feel like we are virtual represent virtual people are us. Um, and so I think that that's gonna be a big part of it. You can meet someone in a virtual world. There's a company called Altspace, which is doing something like that. And you actually feel like you're having a shared experience even though you aren't physically in the same room. So going to the movies will be virtual in a way. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I, what, uh, this is something I'm quite, um, hesitant about in the sense, I think that's what James Cameron is trying to say at the top of your session here, which is that when you all go and watch Nightmare on Elm Street in a room in the dark all together, everybody screams at the same time and they laugh at the same time and they do all that. So, so this communal experience, although we're all watching everything alone on our iPads anyway. Anyway, so it's sort of half answered that question. But I kind of feel like the Facebook buy has a big deal to do with that. I kind of feel like the metaverse is going to have a lot to do with the communal experience in VR, and I'm sort of waiting to see how that plays. So, so my issue here is that I can't ever get past the fact that you, you have to strap something quite big to your head right now to watch this stuff. So I think the, the future of HoloLens and Magic Leap, that'll be interesting to, to watch out for longer term. Uh, but just on the shared experience, well, oh no, hold it. So, so on, on, on the headset, this, this is, this, if you go down the route and you buy into strapping something to your head, that then becomes a very personal experience. So, so one of the things that struck me was um, Bjork's VR piece, um, Stone Milker. Stone Milker. So the thing that, about that that it, it becomes you want a personal experience. Then your favourite performer, if Bjork was your favourite performer, is is there performing directly to you. So that's that's a personal experience, and it's about content for a personal space. But there have been some productions that have tried to create shared cinema. So there's a, a piece um, by Mirada, post-production facility in LA, um, called The Strain. So it was a, a co-marketing release for uh, an, an episodic TV series called The Strain, I believe. And they produced an app for Gear VR that would go across six Gear VRs simultaneously. So you could actually sit and watch the same thing at the same time with your friends. So I'll be really interested to see how, how that works out. But can you tell them where to look? The, the idea is that they have the same content at the same time, but they're free to look wherever they want. Oh, cool. But you can't say, hey, mate, look behind you. There's a dinosaur. So I, I, but you can, yeah, yeah. you can an Oculus toy box. Sorry? You can an Oculus toy box. Awesome. Which was the, it was a demo that they released at Oculus Connect this year where you're, you're, you, have hand, you have hands and you have a head, and so does somebody else in the same virtual space with you. But that person is actually a real person in the analog world that's like six doors down or something. So you're you're in this demo with them. They called it Toy Box because you're you know you're passing a boomerang back and forth and like shooting each other with lasers and stuff like that. Um, and but and you're you're in the same space together. And and the weird thing for me was that after I did that demo, I went and met the person that I had been doing the demo with, the act, the real person. And as I met him, you know, I had no idea what he looked like. I just saw his gestures and the way his head moved and the way he sounded. Um, but I felt like I had already met him, you know, <laughs> because I had interacted with him in a virtual space. And so, and, and that's, I mean, that that's already exists. That technology is already here. Yeah, well, actually, um, I don't know if any of you are aware of uh, Oculus Social. So Oculus Social is, um, lets you actually go into one of the movie, the I mean, they're actually selling or renting movies out on the Oculus Store right now. So any, most of the tentpole 
films are like 15 or 16 dollars. The thing I liked about that was that you buy or you rent out the $16 film movie, and I think in the licensing you get up to five seats. That means you could actually go onto your Facebook and that gets back to your Facebook uh, metaverse uh, thing that they're getting into. So you could probably invite five friends. They could be in the next room. They could be halfway across the world. And you find yourself in the cinema, in this virtual cinema, and their avatar heads are out there. And as you're talking to them, you can talk to each other like you're talking to someone. The good thing is you have a mute switch, I think, which you can't do in real life in cinema. <laughs> but, but yeah, so I think that's where it's going. It's probably uh, movie watching or you know, going to the cinema is actually completely going virtual now at a cheaper cost because the concession stand is just your refrigerator down the hall. You can pause it. <laughs> so is this a threat? Do you, do you feel something's, something's up right now? Is this going to actually you know, tempt people? Yeah, I mean, I entirely think that that moving that somewhere in the future it's going to become a shared experience, right? Virtual virtual reality isn't always going to be us with this weird wonky thing strapped on our head. I don't think it'll probably move towards like augmented reality where you can put in a contact lens <laughs> and see the whole world. Who knows? But I do wonder if part of the power of virtual reality, at least right here and now, is that it's an entirely solitary and uninterrupted experience. You know. You mentioned like Facebook and and uh, how easily distracted we are. And and one of the, my first observations when I was first experiencing VR was that's like one of the only times I was uninterrupted. I didn't check my phone. I couldn't hear what anyone else around me was saying. I wasn't able to look or glance at anything else. It was like the only unadulterated, pure amount of my attention, right? And so I wonder if that's... It befuddles me. I'm like, could that literally be just why VR is so powerful? Because it has our un uninterrupted attention. I don't think that's all there is to it. But, but I think there's something to be said for, for the personal experience and that it's, it's yours and just yours in that moment. And I think the shared experience, at least here and now, is in, is in the, the communication after the fact. You know, the sharing and relating of, of what, was, what was that like for you? And this is what it was like for me. And did you look at so-and-so behind you? No, I was looking at that girl over there. I mean, uh, there's just so much, there's so much to dig into. Yeah, I think uh, Hallie said uh, beforehand about like how can you, in a VR experience, you kind of record this in your memory as it was like part of your real experience. And uh, what we have observed in our work, like uh, usually when people swap bodies or whatever, going through an, to an experience, the process that we do on research is like we do a quick interview just right after they take out the glasses. And usually they cannot state much because they are too, too dizzy and not understanding what is happening. And then we do one interview one week after. And uh, what happens, which is very interesting, is like just 20 minutes, we do 20 minutes experiments. 20 minutes experiment can, can last in your head for one whole week thinking about that, thinking about the other, thinking about what happened. And uh, this is very powerful to, 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 you know, to raise consciousness uh, about each other. And I think this could be probably the social powerness, uh, power of, the, uh, of VR. On the other hand, I think it depends on the experience uh, you develop it just in the beginning. For example, when we do a body swap, you're not alone in, in this experience. You're, you're in two persons. And uh, at some point, they are facing each other. So if you're wearing the goggles, you are facing yourself. Like, for example, I'll be in your body looking at my body. And you actually go shake hands, and you shake hands with yourself. Under your body, I'll shake hands with with this body. And when you remove glasses, you just realize, oh no, we're, I'm shaking hands with the other. So uh, it can become not just an individual experience, it depends on the way that you design the content. Yeah, well, um, it's, it's already happening now, for example. I mean, yours is an experimental piece that you've taken to a lot of film festivals as well as art installations. And now we've come to the point where there's actually virtual reality film festivals. I mean, I've, I've heard of a few of them. Kaleidoscope was one, yeah? Yeah, well, and the, and, the, and the photographs are people all sitting in a room like this with headsets on. You know, the screenings are that. It's not a big uh, cinema. Do you think that um, this thing is going to... I think Sundance, Sundance as well has uh, had it recently. Uh, do you think this is going to be a trend going forward mainstream? Um, you, are we really going to see, in let's say, in the next couple of years, um, features coming out in, in, in VR? Was, is that realistic, or is it going to be further on? 
Uh, I think one, th just through the grapevine, one thing to keep an eye on is Ready Player Zero. I think it's going to be really interesting. Spielberg is making his next film after BFG. As most, like, there's a part of it that's in VR, but I don't think, I think the main strength of that is going to be that it's going to have VR components to it to market it. I think that's going to be really sort of a, a good testing point because he's quite a, obviously, an industry giant. So for him to take the medium under his wing and give it a spin, no matter and to what small degree he gives it a spin, will be very interesting to see what he does with it. Um, and there's not a festival I've submitted my uh, eye, uh, eye for an eye to that doesn't have a, a Tribeca has and Sundance, we're, we're, we're in Sundance in January and then Tribeca in April and Telluride has and so I don't, I don't see it going away anytime soon. Is there any questions from the audience? Okay, get a mic there. Hi, uh, my name is Mohamed Mamdou, I'm a UAE based filmmaker and my question is to everyone. Um, where does the audience participation stop and the filmmaking sort of start? I guess my confusion comes from the fact that what you were talking about earlier, sound-based uh, direction is kind of like the big part of it, but it's all about participation, right? Everything, and a lot of what you've talked about are experiences, immersive experiences, and not so much um, directed storytelling. So I guess, as a filmmaker, I'm just very curious about that. And my second question is, you also mentioned it, uh, Haley, earlier, is augmented reality and where it's going and its place in everything. Because Google you know, announced that big buy into Magic Leap and how that's going to be a different kind of technology from stereoscopic uh, vision and sort of reflecting back on the eye and not having the 8 to 12 minute headache that you have now. So what do you think the impact of that would be as well? Thank you. So the first question was again because... Um, it's about narrative that, storytelling. Like, what, at, at what point does the director's role stop and the audience's role begins in a story, in a film that's okay. shot completely in virtual reality? Because everything that's been released has been more like, oh, I want to touch that, I want to touch sure. this, but where's the storytelling? Ilya, do you want to get that? Uh, well, <laughs> like I said, you have, to, you have to migrate between traditional storytelling and the new medium you have at your disposal. My storytelling began at the screenplay phase my screenplay was written for virtual reality. It wasn't written, I mean, the screenplay traditionally has always been meant to guide the reader to see the film before they see the film. So if you're going to do an immersive experience, your screenplay, to a certain extent, needs to help you do that, right? So there are certain assets to that screenplay where you can read it and have seen the film in VR, right? So the same that you would apply to your screenplay phase in terms of how you're telling your story, what lines of dialogue are important, how you're turning your plot, you know, why you've got a three-act structure, where's your midpoint, where's your, you know, false defeat, or whatever, all that, that, that's, that all applies. That's still storytelling, um, for me, anyway. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that, I think that the, the director creates the world and sets the parameters, right? But I think that within VR, there is a democratization of storytelling, if you will. So as the viewer, you know, there's no longer, it's not this like top-down approach. I'm not giving you a piece of content and telling you like, you know, one, two, three, four, follow this exact path. You. I would imagine you can watch any VR experience an infinite number of times based on what you're listening to, where you're looking, and I think that that's the democratization, right? Is is what do I want? What do I want the story to be? What's the story for me in this moment? And I think from the director's perspective, if you want that person to get something out of the story, like if you want them to do so for us, right? We we always tell stories to compel our audiences to take some sort of action. So for us, we know we've done our job as a director, whether we're just creating that world or setting those parameters, if they do take that action. Does, if that makes sense. So just a, a quick anecdote, we, you know, our first, our first virtual reality experience uh, was on solitary confinement. Um, and we premiered it at Tribeca last year. And in terms of VR, it's like the most rudimentary piece of content. You know, you're sitting inside a solitary confinement cell. It's not like you're like traveling the world. But again, the soundscape is what is what directs that piece. And it's narrated by a man who was wrongfully convicted, imprisoned for 20 years, the large majority of which he spent in solitary confinement. And at the end of the experience, he says, you know, in the next 15 seconds, you get to take off this headset and return to your daily life. For over 80,000 Americans, that's not the case. Signed the ACLU's petition to ban youth solitary confinement. 
we had every single person take off the headset and sign the petition. So for us, we were like, this is the future. <laughs> you know, no doubt. We've been in this business of trying to use stories to drive action for years now and to see something that, to see really a proof of concept. Like, oh, this works was A, compelling to the medium, but B, from a director's perspective, I think showed, great, we did our job. It, it, it worked. Um, I should comment the way that we do uh, our system as a narrative system that we call the embodied narratives. It's kind of a, um, actually not a filmmaking, it's a protocol for everyone could be a performer. So we invite, we usually, like when you get art residencies, we build a system, we show to the local community, and whoever is interested in going deeper, we invite them for doing a performance. So they pre-record an audio uh, about whatever they want to talk about, to share about their lives, and uh, relate part of these uh, sections of this audio relate to some objects. For example, you see yourself in my body, and uh, you're in front of a table full of objects, and maybe you see a portrait, and you're interested in the portrait, and you can choose the portrait, grab the portrait, and you see, and you start to listen to my voice talking about my mother that is in the portrait. Maybe you're not interested, and you put it back, and you grab another object, and you start to trigger some different audio related to this different object. It's, the, it's a way that we, we, we design it to allow users to interact with the story of another. It's, it's one option on, on how to do it. So just, just to try and pick up on both your, your questions. So on, on audience participation, I think there's, there's a couple of things to, to watch next year. So Google Spotlight Stories, they're doing some interesting things. And I think it would be, be really excited to see how that is taken to video content. Maybe some sort of interactive pathways you can explore inside 360 video. That'll be fun if that happens. Um, and, and also, I don't know if any of you here has heard about uh, The Void, which is, has anyone heard about The Void? So this is more like uh, an installation like a, a theme park installation where they, you put on headsets and you can run around inside a physical I, space. I believe something like that starting up in Dubai. I do not know the exact uh, name of the place, but I believe something like that is also coming. Okay. So, so this is a physical experience that you go into and you participate in with other people. And you can actually touch the environment because it's built up to match the CG that's being rendered to your headset. So I think that will, yet again, be another type of experience in, in this space. So the void and, and where that goes, that'll be interesting. And the other question, I think, was about Magic Leap and aug augmented and mixed reality. And for me, that's kind of the successor beyond virtual reality and 360 video on your head. And we were talking earlier, actually, about the different things that are being recorded. Um, there's a company called 8i. Um, they have a, a camera wall that will record people and they have a piece called a message to, correct me if I get this wrong, message to my future self. Um, so you, you, you can go in and you can record, record yourself or a short performance in a, in a spot and then you can play it back and as soon as you play it back in a device like Magic Leap when it comes out, you'll be able to move around, you'll have that positional feeling that they're actually there in front of you. So I think that's really exciting. And there was another piece called... Uh, it's, I, I don't remember, I think it's called 100 Humans or something. Oh yes. It's going to Sundance as well, as well. And there was, uh, well. no, it wasn't quite the one I was thinking of. So there was um, new techniques, new testimonials, the, the piece with the Shoah Foundation. Yeah. Did you know about more on that? I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> So the Show Foundation is doing a, a fascinating project, I, I don't know the proper title, um, but to, to preserve Holocaust survivors, they're basically creating these fully interactive holograms. So they're interviewing uh, Holocaust survivors you know, they'll take one person, interview them for five days straight, ask them a thousand questions. They're interviewed and filmed in this, literally this 360 dome with like 6,000 LED lights and hundreds of cameras. Um, and they create then this hologram that's fully interactive. So they tag all of the data from all of the interview questions and the answers. So, you know, I can pick up a microphone and there's this full 3D real human in front of me and I ask any question I want, you know, what concentration camp were you at and, and when was the last time you saw your mom? You can ask very complicated questions and with sort of a Google API sort of function, it responds back to you. Like, and 
they're literally in that moment answer and it is the most mind-blowing experience you've ever had. I was telling them that, you know, to watch someone else ask the questions, I was like, oh cool, he's talking to a hologram, big deal. And then I grabbed the mic and asked the questions and you find yourself like interacting with this person. Like I was chuckling when I was supposed to be chuckling, I was nodding along, like fully interpersonal relationship. It was mind boggling, but um, in terms of like history and preservation, it's very exciting and promising. Anyone else? Would you want to say something? Yeah, to you? well, I think also, I mean, right now there's a really big um, distinction being made between AR and VR. I don't think that that's necessarily going to be the case in a couple of years. I think we'll just move to one term, maybe mixed reality or whatever it is. Um, I think that right now, um, VR is more like synonymous with technology, like the actual headset and, and whatnot, and AR is more of a concept. Like AR is the, it's the complete opposite of like digital dualism. It's like I am in, I am 100% in the analog world and the digital world at the same time. That's what AR is. So eventually they're gonna be the same device, whether it's eye contacts or, you know, glasses. There's still time for questions, yeah. Oh, hi there, uh, my name's Bob, I'm a producer from London. Um, first of all, thanks to the panel, this has been a really eye-opening session. Um, however, I'm still a skeptic, because um, I've yet to have perhaps my breakthrough moment with this. And just going back to Haley, what you said, but I think a lot of other people have mentioned it in other words. You, you talked about the democratization of the content. Um, just to throw this uh, possibility, what about a benevolent dictatorship? As in, you know, that's the directed story that you're meant to be told. And I just think of two examples in films that I've seen which are very different, where if I had the choice, I wouldn't have had that experience. So first, there's a scene with a very graphic violence against a woman that's happening in front of you. And if I had the choice, I would have turned away. And that could be in lots of horrific circumstances where if there was the true democracy, I'd be looking away or I'd leave the room. And then another film, to give a lighter example, Rocky, one of my favorite films. If I had the choice, I would have gone straight to the fight at the end. But the only reason I enjoy that fight, I think, is because I have to sit through the first hour, which is really boring. So um, what are your thoughts about that? Well, you, you don't sit through it. You make the choice to watch it. So that's almost like it's democratized. <laughs> I also think there are like tiers of democratization, right? I think that it's it's this movement from um, a passive consumer to an active participant. So maybe democratization is the wrong word. Maybe it's just more participatory. But the, I think the point being, you are making. First of all, yes, you're always making a choice whether or not you're watching that or experiencing it, take off your headset, whatever. But secondly, there are choices to be made within that experience, if that makes sense, right? So it's not, you know, I'm not looking at a flat image no matter what. I'm not looking at the same image no matter what. I can look at an infinite number. I can hear an infinite number. I can experience it a number of different ways. So, so as a viewer, I have a sense of agency within that. Any more questions out in the audience? Okay, well, I got, I got one for you guys. Uh, it's probably more on, let's say, getting closer to the region and, you know, uh, let's say, evangelizing VR filmmaking out here now in the EU. You've got government bodies funding this kind of research with no, you know, no need as such for any kind of uh, commercial outcome from it. And you've got private people, probably, like uh, private companies, like, uh, is the foundry private? Yeah, and you've, you, you're the head of research. You're a research scientist out there. Uh, meanwhile, filmmakers are, are going for it. You know, they're, they're not waiting for something to come up and a market to, to take place before they actually go and start experimenting. What, would, what advice would you give in these different areas to, let's say, the filmmakers out here, to the, to, the, to the organizations out here? Because let's face it, I mean, there are organizations out here, there, are, there is money. Uh, how would you focus it on getting this region into something like f the future of filmmaking, as it were. What's, what's your advice to filmmakers, let's say? Sure. My adv Look, the fundaments apply, right? I get pitched things all the time. 
And I'll say, well, that's lovely, but it's not long enough to be a film, or it's not, you know, write a poem, or go write a story. I mean, first of all, the medium has to serve the content. Absolutely, that's not going to change, right? Second of all, the medium, like I said, can't overshadow the content. You know, whether it's empathy or delight, or metaphysical engagements, you know, it, it's, got to, it, it's got to do what it's going to do successfully, and that's always going to separate good content from bad content, just like everything else. Um, but... <sighs> What I would say is that I think this is a running joke between people in VR right now is that, and I think Lucky said it in the Time Magazine article, he said, this is the Pong phase. This is the Pong phase of the medium, right? <laughs> this is the Lumiere brothers right now. So all the filmmakers that don't have distribution and don't have the, the know-how, and those, these are the people that have the plus. These are the people with the advantage because nobody's got a precedent yet. It's all going to be about which of the content which of the, wh wh whose of your imaginations speaks to us the most? Because everybody's watching everything in VR, we're all captivated, and that'll only last for a moment longer. So while there's a gold rush, I would, I would go. I would make content. Yeah, and I think to the note of distribution, you know, you, you're asking like, what does distribution look like for VR? And, and granted, it's, it's limited in its formalities, but I think that's also liberating from a filmmaker's perspective. And and for us, our approach is, you know, this this is such an emerging space that there's no room for exclusivity. You know, there isn't room for like one particular distributor, but rather there's room for for all of them. You know, we're we're VR platform agnostic. When we release a piece of content, we want to put it any and everywhere in hopes that as many people as possible can have their first or second or third or whatever experience with VR. But now is the moment for us to carve a space in this VR community for powerful storytelling so that it's not cannibalized by the gaming and porn industries. You know, I think that, that there's a real risk in that, that if, if we do not clarify and, and preserve preserve the space for VR to be used for compelling stories and by wonderful filmmakers, then we might lose that opportunity. So my advice would be rather obvious, I guess, just because there's so many technical challenges to getting the content to begin with, try it out first, if you, as much as you possibly can. Try and shoot something, shoot something interesting and challenging as a trial. Yeah, I think it's VR is made out to sound like this really difficult thing, but it's like it's it's really easy to just get go like get started. Like you just you can use two GoPros if you want, like as little as two, and you know stitch something together. It's sort of you know other than um, you know how small the network is, which I think is the main barrier to entry for a lot of people is they don't know who to go to. They can't they don't know who to go to to ask for stitching help and that sort of thing. It's sort of the same question as how do you get into two D film. It's like you just do it, and like, and then while you're doing it, you just hope that you meet people and you know learn more and get involved in cool projects. For me, I have to say that our group is actually not interested in VR. Uh, we end up doing that by accident, just because it allows this possibility of building empathy. We believe in helping promoting a shift behavior in the world for a better world, and this is my only advice. We should focus for compelling storytelling or empathy or whatever we believe that can can offer a contribution. If, if I was a funder, I would definitely invest because it's pioneer, like uh, everything that you do will be a lot of attention. There is no distribution on, on, on the one hand, but on the other hand, anyone with a mobile and uh, $6 to buy a cardboard can yeah, watch like the film, so you, you are not constrained by any industry. So if you have a film and uh, you have to go to a place like this to exhibit your film, and there are lovely films that my mother would love to watch, but she won't ever, because it's never going to reach her, uh, because the circuit in virtual reality, you know, six, six dollars is what it costs. Like one cardboard, you put your mobile on, and uh, people just don't know yet. People don't, just don't use it. But uh, it's going to be definitely very democratized. Yeah, there's no distribution, but there's full distribution on YouTube, Facebook, right? All of these are now 360. And just like a tiny piece of practical advice, if you guys haven't seen or heard of the Theta camera, I would say that's probably the easiest point of entry for VR. It's, it's about the size of an iPhone or a flip cam. It has a lens on each side. It records in full 360, and it basically automatically stitches. Hey, he has one. Um, it's called a Theta, T-H-E-T-A. So you've got a whole 180 lens on, 
on the front, and you got a whole 180 lens on the on the on the back. And uh, well, this is the first model that came out, so it's only it's only still photographs. But the the newest one shoots HD, I believe, uh, HD video. Yeah. Yeah. So we actually use these with all of our citizen journalists around around the world. We deploy these Theta cameras. They're incredibly user friendly. You literally press on and record, and whether you're holding it and it's sort of a first person POV, or if you you know you can put it on a little monopod or tri tripod. But um, there are just a couple hundred bucks, and if if you're interested, you know I think it's it's an easy point of entry. Uh, I should add also, if someone wants to try VR, our system, the machine to be another, it's a Creative Commons, no commercial project. So we definitely encourage anyone to copy, replicate. We will help you. We have the documentation online, and, and it's open. So some good food for thought out here. I think the key takeaway was, uh, you know, jump in there rather than wait. Uh, for some commercial avenue to come up with distributors promising you distribution rights, etc. I think that the key out here is it's being done in Hollywood. The big, the big AAA studios are into it. Uh, there's no reason why local filmmakers uh, or regional filmmakers shouldn't be doing the first Arabic uh, VR um, immersive piece of journalism or movie out here. Just one more question, yeah. Great camera people, some of the best in Bollywood. We're actually on a project where we're seeing a living museum come together, and the man is an 81-year-old storyteller. He's the last of the line who can tell us what our living heritage is. After him, there's no one. How, what would you recommend to use in tools like that? We're very short in budgets. How do we use it? And this is the only opportunity. He's actually making a living museum in an airport slot. He's been given an airport play in the Indian airport, and uh, he's making this living museum, trying to collect pieces. There are thousands of craftspeople working. Some of them you'll never even see next year. How do you create um, something that would, be, would capture this moment? Because I don't know how long an 80-year-old man with that kind of passion will live. I, th I think the, the, the best answer that we've had just now is to, to try that Rico thesis. I, I didn't quite catch everything that you wanted to do. You, you want the 80-year-old man to record the content yeah. really easily. Yeah, and because he's the only one who knows the stories. So you have items from 14th century, 15th century. He's been the sole custodian of all these artifacts and pieces which he's been collecting well, th all his this life. This is a very accessible camera. You can simply pick it up, hold it. The, 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 Next step up from that is the type of rig that, that records with six GoPro cameras. Okay. And then that becomes a little bit more bulky. It's relatively cheap, but it's, it's more bulky. You'd have to carry it around on a stick. And then you'd have to deal with stitching it afterwards. So this is very accessible. <laughs> but I just checked the, the specs of what you can get out of video first, though. So with the Ricoh Theta, I don't quite know the resolution you can achieve at video rates. I think it's just HD, I think. It's just, it's just HD. HD. So you, you might, if this is something that you're going to keep for a long time, it's going to be part of an installation. Time. It's probably the only thing we'll have left as a new So you, you want to be able to get the best possible yeah. quality, I think, on the budget that you have. Yeah. So I would step up to a Freedom 360, and I would try it out first. You know, do some trials. Okay, thank you. So. Yeah, what would be really cool is if you could do volumetric capture on it. Like do an 8i or something like that. Obviously that's like would be a huge project, but that would be really amazing <laughs> if you could feel like you were in the room with him. Yeah, probably uh, LIDAR or something, or LITRO, and, but those are all still not done yet. I mean, the, the other thing to say is that if you can get access to post-production, um, we maybe... Can. We can. We can. We have come in and said, we'll give you post-production. So and you, we've had a comfortable relation with them, so it's... So a lot of um, 360 is content is created in post now, okay. simply because it's easier to shoot. So you could shoot with a normal uh, 2D camera, and then you can composite your environment to create the 360 experience. Okay. So you shoot lots of individual elements, and you pull all those elements together. That, that if you can get access to the post-production facility, that could be a good way to go. Yeah, but post-production is usually expensive. <laughs> No, no, they, we partnered with them on three films, so we know they would come in as a partner and do this with us. So. And this is content that nobody in the world has ever seen. 
it's been locked behind doors and everybody would want to explore it. So. Sounds amazing. All right. Is there any questions? One, one, time for one last one, I believe. Yeah? All right, then I think. Um, oh, there is one? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, okay, it's uh, Muhammad Awad from Sudan. I'm a director of uh, documentary films, and uh, my concern with virtual reality. Uh, I'm also an architect, so uh, I believe that uh, virtual reality and uh, and the VR world is linked with some definite people on this earth, but it's not like uh, producing real materials on real world, just like documentaries, it's more touching. Uh, like uh, scenes and images that shows real life have uh, temptations, have uh, its values. So how can we bring emotions to this virtual reality? I think through the story, through the content, the same way that uh, you can make a non-emotional movie or an emotional movie, uh, you, you can get really deep inside uh, one context, like one person's perspective or one situation. You can really feel that you're there. And uh, yes, I, I've, I've seen users uh, crying. You have. I, I have experienced... Uh, there is one in impressive project called The Enemy that was ex exhibited in Tribeca. I, I, you are in the middle of the room and in one side there is one Israeli soldier, the other side there is one Palestinian soldier. And uh, you can approach them, you listen to their perspective. I, I took it out and I was crying for 20 minutes, I couldn't leave the place. So I think uh, you have the possibility. You know, just as a very tangible way to do it, I mean, the VR piece I did has a score. You can score the piece, right? So just as you would traditionally in film to, to sort of, uh, um, you know, choreograph emotion a little bit through scores, you can, you can keep applying these age-old ideas into the new medium. You can do that. Yeah, Thank you. Juxtaposition of images, you know, the contrast of placing you in one location and then the next location is drastically different. The narration that you may hear, I, I think it's this, it's all the same storytelling tools that we've, we've played around with for ever. Um, and, and they apply to VR and we're only now getting to sort of play with them. All right. I, th I think I'd like to thank all of the panelists for a very uh, thought-provoking session. And thank you for coming in here. I hope that next year, probably at the Dubai Film Festival, we have probably a small section on the first local or regional VR films being made and, and, and demonstrated. And then we could invite our panelists back to see the fruits of what they've discussed out here. Thank you. A, a round of applause, please, for all of them.